Welcome back to Coach's Corner, where you literally can treat us like your own personal coach. Send in your training, racing-related questions, and we'll do our best to get back to you and answer them in these episodes. So, on with this one. And this is actually a response to our previous Coach's Corner. Uh, Luke said, the hurry zones for bike versus run deserves their own episode. That's interesting stuff. And you know what? We're doing just that for you. We've got yeah. a video on that coming very soon, so stay tuned. That is interesting. We, we spoke last week in the Coach's Corner about what, why your heart rate so much higher on the run versus the bike. So yeah, watch the space video coming soon. It really it is an interesting topic, to be fair. Um, so first question then, Ross Horsley. Um, any advice for coming back from a major crash, both, both physically and confidence-wise? I was hit by a car a month ago on a training ride and I'm struggling equally with not knowing how to come back from a month of zero training while I recovered and having lost my confidence to cycle on the road. Sorry to hear about your mm. crash, Ross. That's awful. Uh, it is part of riding a bike, unfortunately. Uh, we'd rather it didn't involve cars, if possible, though. Um, I've actually been there. I've, I've had been a there as well. major incident on the bike. Luckily, it mine didn't involve a car, but it did involve a uh, collapsed lung and a few broken ribs and uh, plenty of time off from training. Uh, I think... My first point would be don't underestimate the effects of a crash on your body. Uh, it's very easy for uh, your superficial wounds, a little bit of road rash, a little bit of grazes here and a bruise there uh, to heal pretty quickly. Uh, but the underlying injuries may linger a lot more. Things like uh, misaligned hips or a tight back or a tight neck uh, and they can throw out your whole body, they can throw out your spine which can cause all kinds of issues. Uh, so don't underestimate the effects of them. In fact, I would always suggest if you've been in a, even a moderate crash, to go and see a car and make sure everything's aligned before you start ramping up the training again. It is quite dangerous to go and start pushing that again when something might be out of whack uh, and find out six months later that it's because of that crash you had a long time ago. So start there on your comeback trail. I'm gonna jump in there because I think it's amazing how quickly your body can start to overcompensate and you have no idea. I, I've even had the smallest knocks when I've fallen off my mountain bike and my hips have been out of line and you start overcompensating on one leg versus the other and a glute switches off and it, it just, you can get yourself in a bit of trouble, really. Um, Onto your, your actual question though, coming back from it, how do you get back to it and uh, how long does it take? Now that's something that everyone can relate to even if they've never been hit by a car. Everyone said something that's uh, taken them out of training for a while and uh, they've had to get back to it. Now as a general rule, uh, when you are out of training and you, if you're doing nothing of course, uh, you can generally use the formula of for every day out, it's going to take you two days to get back to that same fitness. So if Ross was out for a month, he realistically has to look at two months before he gets back to the same fitness he was when he had that crash. Uh, that is a, a very good rule of a thumb because what is gonna happen probably is two or three weeks into your training, you're gonna start feeling great. Uh, and then the temptation is to push too hard, too much, and that's when the injuries happen, that's when the niggles come in and you're back at square one. So keep that in mind, if you've been out for a week, two weeks before you're back to pushing what you were before, if you're out for a month, two months before you're pushing back to what you were before, uh, and just keep that in the back of your mind as you start ramping up and feeling better again. Yeah, and that will just give you time to really build things up gradually, respect the effect that this crash, or whatever it may be, has had on your body. Um, and yeah, just, just really, you know, allow that time. But also in terms of the anxiety or, or worries of going out on the road, um, this is this is certainly a big thing. So do just try and go and enjoy the training a little bit more. So perhaps going to like ride with your friends or or just go mountain biking perhaps or, or spending time on Zwift. Some other things that are gonna slowly build that confidence up without just throwing yourself straight in the deep end with riding fast out on the road with traffic around you. Yeah, thanks for asking that question though because I think a lot of people can relate to that whether they've unfortunately been hit by a car or not. Um, I think everyone at some point has to take some time out. Next one, and this is an age old question as they've said themselves from uh, Matthew Tones. He says, I have a 70.3 in a month and a full Ironman in three months. I have just been struck down by quite a vicious cold um, and been in I've been on the couch for five days how do you recommend approaching training with a cold push through it question mark rest and gradually get back into it question mark I feel like I've lost valuable training days and could take time to re uh, recover pre-sickness levels yeah a bit similar to the to the previous question as far as coming back from it goes it depends how much time you took off uh, if you took off three days you need to be looking at six days before you back to your full training uh, it's 
it is difficult to, to judge that. And obviously, if you can keep doing something, you can bring those days to, re to return to training back down quite substantially. So what you do want to do is keep ticking over if you can. But there's some rules to follow as far as training with a cold or any illness. Uh, and the rule of thumb is- General. General, of... very general rule of thumb is what they call the neck check or the above the, the neck rule. So if your symptoms are only above the neck, so I'm um, talking about sore throat, nasal congestion, coughing, sneezing, itchy eyes, uh, then you can keep going. Uh, you should probably do that with a slightly lower heart rate and not strain yourself too much. Your body's obviously fighting something. You don't want to overstress it, but you can keep going. If your symptoms are below your neck, I'm talking uh, stomach issues, uh, heat fever, anything like that, body aches, anything like that, then you definitely need to rest and give your body time to deal with that. If you do something like training when you've got a fever, for example, you overloading a system that's already overloaded and you could really make yourself even more ill. Yeah, and I think it's important to um, just understand that when you have a cold, a virus, anything, it is a sudden stress on the body. Now, when we do training, we also stress the body. So you are really overloading the body. So do respect the fact that your body is trying to fight something, get rid of it. It is working overtime. So you do not then add to that overly with a load of training. And actually I am probably, I err on the side of caution more often than not when I have a cold, because if I can nip it in the bud quickly and get rid of it in a day or two, even if it is a very light cold, that's it, I'm back on with training in a couple of days time. Yeah, if you, if you stop straight away, basically think of it as giving your body all the energy you possibly can to fight the infection instead of using half of it to do some, maintaining some fitness while your body's trying to deal with this other thing. Yeah, and I will actually add in terms of those things that you might do when you have got a cold. I tend to advise avoiding the swimming pool. It's just a breeding ground for germs and also just not very pleasant for other people if you're taking an illness along there. Also running tends to deliver a bit more stress to the body because of the impact, etc. And um, So if you're looking to do something very light, just jumping on the bike indoors for just 30, 40 minutes and spinning the legs over is often a great thing to do when you're just initially feeling the symptoms of a cold or a virus. Yeah, get well soon. On to our next question and that's from Clement Suligodj, and he says, how should I train if I want to qualify for Kona in let's say two or three years? I'm 27 and currently doing around 20 hours a week. Well, what a great goal to qualify for Kona. We can certainly uh, emphasize with that. It's, it's an awesome goal, but it's not easy. It's going to be difficult. Uh, you off. No, not to put you off at all. The first best thing to do if you want to qualify for Kona is to be very careful about which race you pick. Basically, you want to pick the race that suits you best. So look at all your strengths and your weaknesses. If you really need that wetsuit to swim, don't go to a hot race where they're not going to give you a wetsuit. If you are really good at climbing your bike on hills, go to a hilly race because you're going to get that advantage. Don't go to a flat time trial race. Uh, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing is to do your research into the race that you're going to do. Uh, look at what previous times people have done there, what the age group podiums were um, at that race in the past and then you can really get an idea of what you need to be aiming for to get your slot uh, and I'm not counting the uh, lucky roll downs which you might get but you don't really want to rely on luck when you're trying to qualify for Kona. So look at what you need to do uh, and then you can use that information to take to your coach and go this is where I want to get and with your coach you can sit down and go well this is what we need to work to to get to these times. Yeah, and we're talking about coaches because in our opinion, if you do seriously want to get to Kona, a coach is probably one of the best investments you'll make and actually probably one of the smallest when we talk yeah. about going to Kona. <laughs> yeah, Kona is not cheap. And when you add it all up after Kona has happened, the amount you spend on your coach will probably be the smallest ticket item. Yeah, and I think well worth it because if you're serious and you really want to go to Kona, then do it well, do it properly. Absolutely. Good luck with your uh, Kona qualification. Yeah, Let us know when you get that slot. Absolutely. Next one then from Fra Francois Rivier. Um, when training for a specific triathlon distance, i.e. 70.3, how long should the weekly long run be? Should it be 21K plus 10% for instance? And should this be repeated every week? This question also applies for long bike rides. Should it be 90K plus 10% and long swims? 1.9K plus 10%. Well, the long distance sessions in swim, bike and run are very important parts of the training. Now, they're done substantially below race pace, but they are 
build the vital building blocks for your training. Basically, they are your most important thing for aerobic conditioning, for training your body about fuel utilization, about your bone density, your capillary density. All of these things are trained at substantially below race pace, but uh, going slightly longer. Uh, so they're very important and you need to do them right, which means doing the right length and doing the right number of them. Yeah. Now let's take an example. Say you are training for a 5K run. Um, if you're out doing a marathon or something like that every week, that is not specific in the slightest. And actually that is gonna be detrimental. It's going to have a knock-on effect to some of those sessions during the week that maybe could have been more specific. So for something like a 5K, you're probably looking around a 15 K long run at the most. And then as we go up in the distance, that kind of buffer or the percentage uh, on top of the distance kind of comes down a little bit. So as we go to a uh, half marathon, you probably don't want to be doing your long runs much more than a half marathon distance. And then we get to a marathon, you certainly don't want to be doing marathons in your training week in, week out. In fact, you probably wouldn't say you should be doing much more than two to two and a half hour long runs at the most. Final question from Jamie Thurman, and I like this one. Now he said, is it okay to modify a workout prescribed by one's coach? If so, how best to avoid the feeling of guilt that can come with shortening or changing it based on body feel? If I miss a workout, should I try to reschedule it for a different day? Okay, well, <laughs> this is the uh, coaching conundrum, isn't it, uh, with working with your coach? It is absolutely okay, and you absolutely always should listen to your body first and your coach second. Now, that means if you need to skip a session because you feel absolutely lousy, you should skip that session. You need to obviously let your coach know, discuss why you skipped it, and then move on with the program. Uh, you don't want to try and make it up in the next day or the following day because that will have a knock-on effect and domino effect down your whole program and everything will just go out of whack. You miss a session, it's gone, you talk to your coach about it and you carry on with the program. Yeah, and I will add that, it, as James has said, it is absolutely fine to miss workouts. Things come up, life, family, work, etc. cetera. Um, and by working with your coach, you can still get the most out of a program. If your coach is on it and helping you and they're very proactive, they will just modify the remaining few days to the week and they'll make sure that you're still getting the quality in there and you're essentially not missing the value and the benefit you might have got from that workout. So it's absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, as you said, don't do catch up. But an important thing when it comes to deciding as to whether you should do a workout or not, don't do it from your couch. Yeah, this is a golden rule, I think, of mine, and it's something that I've, I've always pushed quite hard with anyone I've coached. You cannot decide whether you are up for a session while you're lying on your couch watching Netflix. You need to get up, get your shoes on, get out the door, and then you can decide. So when you're lying on the couch and that voice in your head says, uh, I can't do it, I'm too tired, I'm too sore, uh, I still feel last week's session, I'm so, I'm so hurting. That voice is lying to you. You need to turn it out, you need to put your shoes on, and you need to get out the door. If after 15, 20 minute warm up, and, and you're out there, you've still got that voice in your head going, I'm so tired, I'm so sore, I've still got that session in my legs, maybe you should turn around uh, and call it a day and speak to your coach about rescheduling or changing the program a little bit. However, most times, you're probably gonna find that voice in your head was lying to you while you were watching Netflix. It just wanted to watch more Netflix. And you enjoy your session and you think, well, I can't believe I almost skipped that by lying on the couch for the rest of the afternoon. Maybe we should bring in like a coffee rule. If after three coffees you still don't want to go, then uh, you have to... Uh, no? Okay, well... If after three coffees I, I might just shake my way off the bike. <laughs> it's, that's, that's probably not good advice. <laughs> okay, ignore that one. Ignore that tip. I definitely shouldn't make coaches corner. Uh, fantastic questions though from everyone this week. So thanks ever so much. As always, please do keep them coming in using that hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. Leave them in the comment section down below or below any video for that matter. Um, if you've enjoyed today's video, please do give it a thumbs up, give it a like, and don't forget to subscribe just down below.